This is so fun. <laughs> I like, know. Down there. Down there. Down there. It yeah. is so fun. <laughs> Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 10 of The Agency Way, a Room 214 weekly blab series to help marketers learn from subject matter experts uh, within a marketing agency, in addition to guest thought leaders in business and marketing worldwide. Room 214's Erica Stutzman is my co-host, signed on here as The Agency Way. Uh, I'm Jason Cormier, the co-founder of Room 214, a digital and social media marketing agency. Uh, our guest on the show today is Ryan Van Duzer. Uh, Ryan's an adventure filmmaker. He's a television host and motivational speaker. His work has appeared on the Travel Channel, uh, National Geographic, Men's Journal, uh, and the Discovery Channel. And the Daily Camera. And the Daily Camera. Hey, right here in Boulder, baby. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when he's not off traveling around the world, um, often by bicycle, He's trying to find ways to expand his brand and connect to a new audience, uh, which is really interesting. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. This is uh, really fun. I always like engaging in, in new technology, and I had never heard of Blab until I got the email from Erica, so I'm <laughs> honored to be part of all this. Great. Awesome. That's excellent. Hey, by the way, um, real quick before we get into the questions, uh, Scoble did an awesome interview with the CEO of Blab. Uh, lots of insights there on where the platform is going next. One of the things that I'm excited about uh, is the idea of being able to use screen share uh, technology so that, I mean, it's great that we're having a conversation and people can see our faces and stuff, but every once in a while you think, gosh, if I could just share my screen or bring something in for, for people to see and, and allow them to zoom in on it, that would be sweet. And so it sounds like that's on the product roadmap and, and that's coming. So That's a great idea. Cool, and we can uh, we'll post the link in in the blog follow uh, the blog follow up. It's funny right. when you're dealing the with blog that we will do. Really tricky words like blog and blog and blab. Uh, and yeah, because yeah, we they do all a, meld together when you write them too. I know, we do a blog summary on the blab. Oh my yeah. gosh. Okay, let's get started. Hey, Ryan, um, to get us started, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, your adventure storytelling how it's evolved over time, maybe how did it start out and where do you see it headed? Uh, my storytelling started really, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Honduras and I lived there for two years. And when I finished my service, I bought an old mountain bike and I rode it all the way home, back home to Colorado after I finished my service. And I filmed that entire adventure and submitted that short documentary to the to the travel channel and they actually played it on air and from that moment on i was like i want to share stories i want to share adventure stories with people from all over the world so that's kind of how it got started with the idea in my head but then i you know i came back to boulder after being in college and then the peace corps and i had a, a public access channel on channel 54 in boulder and i would just run around with my little camera and film adventures. And the show I created was called Out There. And I would just do things that were fun out there. And they, you know, my content's always been relatable. It's not like I'm some technically trained, super elite athlete. Um, everything I do on camera, I want the viewer to be able to do. And from there, that led into working with the Daily Camera. Daily Camera started doing a lot more online video. And that's kind of where I became the out there guy. Every single week, I would have a new video highlighting something cool in in and around the Boulder area. So that's kind of how I got started with adventure storytelling. And from there, I'm still a freelancer. I'm always hustling and always looking for the next project and pitching stories and ideas to brands or production companies or uh, TV channels themselves. Great. Very cool. Hey, I, I just real quick, I have to say, um, it's a small world. Travel Channel actually used to be a client of ours. Oh, wow, cool. Uh, yeah, they probably put us on the map in terms of a social media agency, like wow. back in 08. Wow. Um, but the reason I bring that up is because when we were doing social media for the travel channel, we, I can't even tell you how many people would write to us and be like, I've got an idea. I've got a video, you know, for a show and so on and so forth. And of course those people never stood a chance because it was the production companies for travel channel that were finding the content and people are always trying to go in through the wrong way. So yeah. I think it's pretty amazing that you actually did something that picked up their attention and were able to follow through with it. I was, I was relentless. I was like, I'm going to be a travel show TV host. I wanted to be just like the crocodile hunter or Jeff Corwin. And what I did is I would, I made all these so that, the public access show really was my avenue into becoming a TV show or a TV show host. And so I would chop up all the 
30 minute shows into like three minute videos. And I would send them to producers at the travel channel over and over and over and over and say, Hey, I'm not just a host. I can also shoot and edit. I'm a one man band. And that's when they started sending me out on projects and I was doing things for travelchannel.com and I would make these web series and they saved a lot of money because they weren't sending an entire crew out. They were just sending me. So that's, it's just a lesson in just uh, going for what you want <laughs> and being slightly annoying. There's, time for that. <laughs> I mean, there's other words to, to describe that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Determined. <laughs> Focused. Yeah. So to, let's talk a little bit. So you're a TV guy, which, you know, is considered sort of old media at this point, uh, right? Um, which I'm familiar with. Um, so being a TV guy, so people really self-select their content now and they're going and finding what they want to watch in different ways. How do you sort of build your brand in a way that bridges the old with the new. Yeah. So TV, like you said, really is old. Like 10 years ago, I was like, I want to be a TV host. That is like the pinnacle of what's the coolest thing I could ever imagine. And now it's like, you don't really have to be a TV host to tell stories, to make a living traveling. And that's what's so great about new technology and being able to shoot and edit and create your own content. And that's why, you know, I've really the past couple of years sort of focusing more on on YouTube and making my own videos with my own voice that are my own genuine point of view because TV, you have 15 editors above you that all want a say in the show and they're calling while you're filming and say, oh, don't forget to say this and we want you to wear this and don't be too edgy and we want you to be, you know, cater to a 45 to 50 year old audience and I'm constantly getting bombarded by just stuff because, you know, the, the TV channels are beholden to advertisers and stuff. And it's kind of annoying. Okay. <laughs> but now with online and YouTube, you can be your own editor. Like I can post something online right now and nobody needs to approve it. Hmm. It's great. I love it. And you can have the total freedom to say what you want to say and do the adventures that you want to do. You know, I was a host of a show called Paradise Hunter a few years ago. And it was cool. It was great. But I could care less about luxury travel. That's not me. I can do it and I can pretend to like it. But luxury travel is not me. What's me is like really connecting with people around the world uh, on, you know, just a very simple level and showing the world through my eyes, more of like a, a backpackery type traveler, as opposed to like, look how expensive this hotel is and look how amazing this place is. So, yeah. Um, yeah, with as far as like self-selecting in your question, it's like, yeah, I choose um, a lot of the stuff that I choose is the stuff that I'm most passionate about myself. And I know when I choose those projects, it's going to really show up um, in my videos. And people, the viewers, know it. when They know when I'm excited that they get excited. Like, okay, Ryan's really into this one. This is good. Yeah, I think, you know, people really appreciate the authenticity. And your point about, you know, the traditional TV set, you've got all these editors that they want to put their fingerprints on it and they want to, well, you know, we got to shape it towards this audience or that audience. And, you know, even back in the day, back in the day, <laughs> you know, what, six, six wow. years ago or whatever, you know, Anthony Bourdain at the travel channel, yeah. he was like, screw you guys. I'm going to oh. do what I want to do. I mean, he, yeah. he did it more than anybody, I think. And, Absolutely. and people, people saw that authenticity and uh, it's a huge part of really what's made him successful. So, but anyway, back, back to, um, you know, I, I would really like to know just for our audience, maybe tell us a little bit more about your YouTube channel. Um, you know, what's on it exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so I started putting videos on YouTube right when YouTube came out in 2006. And this is right. Also when I got my career started doing the public access TV show. And at the time it was like, I'm on TV. TV is so cool. Web is just kind of like, the place to throw my videos and it's kind of neat but nobody watches web videos tv is where it's at um but now that is complete opposite um i've been putting my videos on youtube since 2006 i guess it's 2016 now wow it's 10 years <laughs> um but my stuff on there is really a lot of my own personal adventures the things that i love to do uh, a lot of my long bike tours across the country and up and down, all of my content from those rides are on the YouTube channel. Pretty much my YouTube channel is a place for me to share the stories that I care about that TV networks don't care about. Um, so it's a place for my real content. So if you're ever looking for like stuff that I really, truly love and care about in this world and the people I connect with, YouTube is really 
what I, that's where I go to put my videos. And I would say most successful YouTubers do the same thing. There's people out there that make millions of dollars just off of their, their YouTube followings. And um, you watch some of it, you're like, wow, this is really low production value, or this is not not even that impressive, but they have 2 million followers. And it's like, wow, how do they do that? And they do it because they're genuine and real. And it's just like, you know, people can feel like they know you like, oh, this is Ryan's new vlog for the day. Let's see what he's up to. So it's, it's really exciting for people to be able to follow their favorite YouTube stars in that way. No doubt. No doubt. And I think maybe, uh, you know, if you're a producer, a creative artist, somebody who wants to promote your brand yourself on YouTube, um, maybe you can share with our audience, are, are there certain things that, that you're doing, whether it's a top three or whatever that you believe are essential for using the platform? Yeah, I, there's a lot of brands that are they're, they're getting it with YouTube. They're like, oh, wow, we could uh, throw our jackets or clothes or shoes on a very popular YouTuber, and we know that they're going to get millions of views. So they're, so they're essentially buying an audience, and they, they go after YouTubers that they really feel connect with their mission. So there's some brands out there that I work with, a lot of the outdoor companies, um, like Marmot and some of those people. And I wear their clothes. They know that if I wear their stuff in my videos, it's going to be seen by an audience that really wants to get outside and do stuff and engage in the great outdoors. So for a brand, you know, I say always look for something that really aligns with your mission. Every company has a mission statement, you know, and there's millions of YouTubers around the world that are all doing something different from mom, mom YouTubers to outdoor adventure to prankers to, to everything. And there's pretty much an outlet for, for every brand. And I think it's a lot cheaper than traditional media right now to be able to, you know, work with these people one-on-one. -on -one. And then when you're working with a YouTuber one-on-one, -on -one, you can really create this really cool, genuine ad campaign, if you want to call it that, that's not like over the top, like here, drink Coca-Cola. It's just, the stuff is kind of just organically in, in the videos. Mm -hmm. So, so it sounds like for on the brand side, you're saying, maybe some of the best advice is, you know, find an influencer, find, find someone yeah. who's got an existing channel on YouTube, an existing audience. Yep. Uh, and I know as an agency, we will actually look for people that are not yet superstar status yet, if you will, yep. uh, because chances are um, they might actually, you know, wear the clothes that you want them to wear oh. uh, and, and, you know, be motivated and, yeah. and inspired by. But like today, I'm wearing this in honor of Captain America. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he's sponsoring you. Yeah, he's sponsoring. Yeah, so does the state of Colorado. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, but I totally know what you mean. I worked with Crocs a few years ago, and at the time, they were really focused on the mom bloggers that you know got millions of views, and their kids would run around in the little Croc shoes, and it was like so cute and fun. And the moms aren't sitting there like, these croc shoes are so amazing. My kids love them. And it wasn't over the top. It's just the shoes just happened to be in the video, you know? Yeah, I love what you, so I'm going to get to my next question, but I love what you're talking about is really an authenticity about that market that a brand can promote itself with the follow, the people are following those, those YouTubers because they like their show, not necessarily because I think it's important to see. And so to have that authentic brand connection is not so much like putting the brand out there, but just that's something that fits into that lifestyle and it's a real story. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. So what are some of the pitfalls for a self promoter on social media? And I really want to know from you, like what you see as far as social platforms that are just really killing it and ones that where you've seen mistakes made or even mistakes that you've maybe made over time. Yeah. I always be careful with social media because with my YouTube followers, when they hit that subscribe button, they are, that's a big deal for them. It's almost like subscribing to a cable channel. They, they want, they know that you're going to provide them good content that they really want to watch and that they care about. So if you start going off brand or start put, promoting too much, it's going to annoy them or whatever. So you really have to like, cater to those subscribers you have, whether it's YouTube or Twitter or Periscope or whatever, and stay true to what you do. Um, if I all of a sudden started talking about uh, politics and going off crazy in my videos, I think I would lose a lot of my followers. I might gain some as well, but I might lose uh, the ones that have been with me for the longest amount of time. Um, some of the social media platforms that I used to like, but I don't like anymore, Vine, 
was really cool when it first came out. It was the six second videos and it was one of the first platforms where people could tell these really fast, cool stories. And I think it's kind of burned out for me personally. It's gotten really kind of slapstick, dumb humor. It's gotten very young. It used to be very, I don't know. When I first got into Vine, I thought it was awesome, but it's not awesome anymore. But a lot of people still like it, obviously. Um, Instagram's one of my favorite outlets. I think it's the cleanest form of social media. You know, you can take these store these photos and tell these amazing stories, at least for me personally, around the world. And it, you know, it saves all your your photos in a nice, you know, library and it's just clean and nice and you don't get ads like Facebook and all that other junk. So I, I particularly like Instagram uh the best. Um oh, and, yeah. and YouTube for me is like YouTube is what I'm really going for this year. The past few years with YouTube, I would just kind of throw videos on there as kind of a resume site. And I didn't really use YouTube for the powerful medium that it is. And this year, I'm like, okay, this year I'm going to make one video a week. I'm going to make 52 videos this year. Start vlogging, they call it, and and try to really build up more of a, a followership on YouTube. Because, like I said earlier, I'm sick of you know the TV format. Like I'm always waiting by the phone for the producer to call, or I shoot a pilot, and I get so excited. And everybody tells me it's going to get a green light and then months go by and months go by and I'm waiting and waiting. And it's just incredibly frustrating with YouTube. If I build up my following big enough, I would never need to be on TV ever again. Cause I know that my followers and subscribers would support the channel and revenue and money. And I could choose essentially whatever adventure I want to do. So, so Ryan, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, just being authentic to, to yourself and, and to your audience uh, as as really a best practice um, within YouTube, is there anything else that comes to mind, like just from a tactical perspective, things that you've learned, uh, do's, do nots uh, with yeah. YouTube? Um, when I first got into YouTube, everybody said, keep them short, keep the videos really, really short because people have no attention span. And I think to a small degree, that's true. But now I'm like, you know what? If you're making really good content, I don't know if it matters how long the video is. As long as you're telling it a, a very engaging story, I think people will stay with you the whole way. So I think the idea of it has to be short and snappy and pretty much not say anything, just be short. I think those days are over, at least for me personally. Um, but um, so that's one of the things that I say look out for. Um, editing is something that's important, but I think when it really comes down to it, it's storytelling. And you can tell a story with a six second Vine or a 15 second Instagram video. It just depends on uh, your ability to engage with the audience and start with a character or a subject or a challenge or whatever and take that, take the viewer through the hardship and the ups and the downs and you, re you know, resolve it at the end. It just kind of, it just depends what your subject matter is. And so I think people get stuck, you know, with, oh, I need the best camera and it has to be 4K and all this other junk. I don't think that's true at all. I think as long as you're telling short, engaging stories that are true to you and yourself and your audience, that people will see that. Mm -hmm. you know, I shoot a lot of my videos with a small camera this size, you know, and that's all you really need these days. You don't need to have these giant rigs and all that stuff. I mean, it's cool. I'm not bashing those kind of cameras, but uh, if you want to be a successful YouTuber, you could do it with a $300 camera. Right, right. I I do have one more question because you, earlier you you brought up Vine um, and just kind of how, you know, I think you said it's childlike or whatever, yeah. whatever you said about it. And, you know, every time I think of YouTube, um, I can never help but think of the nature of comments on YouTube yeah. and they are like the worst. I mean, people, people just seem to go in of all the social networks. People just feel like, I don't know, is there like a, a prompt in front of the YouTube comment that says, please cuss and take out all your angst here. Yeah. Because it seems like that's what they do. So all that to say, how do you deal with that? Cause I am assuming this is happening on your channel as well. Oh yeah. <laughs> I was actually just last night going through a lot of comments. I actually have my comment notification thing turned off. Usually um, people, you get like an email saying, somebody just commented on your video. And I have all that turned off. And it's like, bing, 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 bing. Yeah, it's yeah. just, people, I mean, I don't I don't think of that seriously. I've put my life out online and in the TV world for 10 years now. And people are just going to be jerks. That's just kind of the nature of it. Even with the daily camera, I'd write articles and people would be like, oh, this is, 
just some rich privileged kid, you know, running around the world. And it's like, no, I'm not at all, but thanks for chiming in. Um, with those comments, I mean, I don't pay attention to any of them because it's usually just some angry kid in his mom's basement or whatever, just trying to stare stuff up. But for every bad comment there are, there are a lot of really good, inspiring comments. And those are the comments that keep me going, that get me excited. People will watch one of my videos and say, wow, I've never run a marathon before, but because of your video, I'm gonna train and run my first marathon. Or, you know, I love the, the video of you taking your mom to Peru and hiking Machu Picchu. I wanna take my mom on a vacation now. And so those are the types of comments that really get me excited and make me feel good about the content that I'm creating. It's all the, the other junky ones that I just kind of smile and laugh it off. Yeah, no doubt. Cool. Well, uh, I know we've gone over our 20 minutes today. Uh, Already? Yeah, I know, man. Fast. I told you. Yeah. Time flies. Time flies. Um, so I'm actually going to, we'll stay on a little bit longer after we uh, cool. hit the stop button on the record button because uh, most there are some people that will probably have questions or, yeah. or want to continue the conversation. But Ryan, I want to, again, thank you for joining us. Um, Erica, I'd love for you to, to close us out as usual. Okay. So the final three today, I have a book recommendation and I love, I love to read, I'm, but I'm going to tell you, you must read this book. Okay. Sounds good. I'll write it down. I got my notes. Presence by Amy Cuddy. Okay. Um, she's a Harvard professor. She's best known for her Ted talk on power poses. Um, She's okay. brilliant. And I think being present is something that not only as a businesswoman, but as a mom and as a human being and as a person, um, I just, is something that I struggle with personally. And I think all of us can do a little bit more work on our being present and in the moment. And multitasking is awesome because you get a lot done, but you're also kind of distracting anything then. So presence is, that's the, that's my focus for the year. Oh, I like it. Thank you. My shout out of the week was inspired by you, Ryan, and it is communitycycles.org. Woo! Community Cycles. Which I just posted um, on our right screen if you guys want to check that out. They're an awesome organization. They are very environmentally focused and focused on encouraging community cycling and commuting. But they also do awesome things like give bikes and refurbish bikes for children who can't afford them during the holidays. And um, they're just pretty much all around awesome. And I love them. They are. I can second that. They are very good. So, And then the, I have a quote of the week, um, which is by Tony Hawk, who's an entrepreneur, since this is business focused, but he's also kind of a rad skateboarder. And I did just say rad, so I know I just aged myself, but... <laughs> Rad is a word that is still and will forever be cool. Oh, good. Okay. So Tony Hawk says, my definition of success is doing what you love. I feel many people do things because they feel they have to and are hesitant to follow their passion. Yeah. Go Tony. I actually I follow Tony on Instagram. I love his stuff. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even know that. Yeah. That's great. All right. Well, hey, thanks again to everybody who's joined us today. As a reminder, you can follow us on Twitter at room underscore 214. You can also subscribe to our email newsletter by going to room, room 214.com slash blog. Uh, and you can message uh, Erica on Twitter. Uh, she's right there as at the agency way. Uh, if you'd like to be a guest on our show. Um, our weekly series continues every Thursday at 1130 a.m. Mountain Time. On behalf of everyone at Room 214, thank you for joining us on another episode of The Agency Way. Bye. Thank you. Ooh, see you later. <laughs> yeah, definitely, Ryan. <laughs> Jump in there because I'm in the early stages of this. Yeah. <laughs> I just well, I was in Guatemala actually filming a video for a nonprofit that uh, gives scholarships to young indigenous girls so that they can continue their schooling and, and work up and get better jobs and break the cycle of poverty. And I had made a video for them before three years ago. And I just, they just kind of plopped me around at these schools with my camera and I'd film all these kids and they're happy and they're fun and they have their books. And it's just like, it was just very superficial. It was like a kind of a traditional like nonprofit video, like look at our happy kids. And all your money is making these kids better. Life is so good and blah, blah, blah. It was, it was fine. It was effective. But when they called me again this year to make another video, I was like, I don't want to do that again. I want to go live with these families in the middle of nowhere and document what life is really like for them mm -hmm. and not just show the happy, shiny parts of, of what your money does, but show like actually how these kids live. And so I lived in these mud huts. It was actually much rougher than when I was in the Peace Corps. 
and mud huts and you know um they have to like go to a well to get their water and it was like for me even it was like wow this is definitely a lot more primitive than i thought it would be and so i'm editing that video together now mm -hmm. that will give the viewer a much more real look of what rural life is like in guatemala and so that goes to the whole idea of just creating real genuine content that's not just superficial and a bunch of kids you know, smiling and laughing and life is so good. It's like, this is what it's really like. And if you'd love to help out, you know, um, this, you know, the benefits can be amazing because you'll be breaking the cycle of poverty because most kids in Central America only go till sixth grade and they start working in the fields and it's just this never ending mess. Um, so I tried this time really to get more down uh, to the nitty gritty of, of why this needs to happen. Do you think that that's kind of like putting forth a certain amount of tension? Putting for, yeah, a little bit of tension. It's a little bit like, you know, it's, it's eye opening. It's shocking to most Americans when I'll show them this video, like, whoa, like these kids live this way all together, the same family and one under one roof that, you know, is, you know, mm -hmm. leaking and there's no electricity. And yeah, yeah, I think there's a, there's a degree of that for sure. Hey, you know, one thing I wanted to bring up was, uh, you know, since we're talking YouTube, I believe I, I got off the phone yesterday with a CEO of a company called Dot Sub. Uh, so it's just, let me just make sure I'm saying that right. It might be Sub Dot. Hang on, let me. Look. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's Dot Sub. Uh, I'll I'll type it in here. And this is uh, basically what what the CEO was telling me was that um, YouTube videos are seen over seventy percent of all YouTube videos are watched by um non-english speaking people wow. um, and so essentially his platform allows for the translation of videos into different languages and these guys have been around for a long time i think google's one of their clients um and from what i understand it's a pretty affordable on-ramp to get your videos translated um into into other languages and it and it does a better job of uh, what the native platform does within YouTube. Anyway, all that to say, I was wondering, um, have you guys thought about that? And is that something you would even be interested in pursuing in terms of different different languages? Yeah, I would say I've only really created videos. The only other language has been in Spanish and I'll keep them in Spanish and I will personally translate it back into English. So um, it's, it's a really cool idea though. I mean, if that's 70% of the world's YouTube audience doesn't speak English, I mean, that's a huge market if you start actually making it available to the whole world. That's actually cool. That's cool. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. I, I, I've i noticed, uh, at least on um, the Active Towns, uh, which is the name of the uh, initiative that, that uh, I have um, on our Facebook page, we tend to get uh, some very interesting, when you go back and you look at kind of the, the trend analysis and find out what countries you're, you're getting uh, interactions from, um, it's really impressive. And I've got somebody, I think, from Japan who oftentimes, you know, bounces and shares my stuff off. And I don't know who it is or, yeah. or what he's even saying about it, but I'm like, cool, thumbs up. <laughs> and that's what's so cool about the YouTube videos is the entire world pretty much has access to it. Mm -hmm. yeah, you can reach, you know, somebody like I make these videos in my house in Boulder, Colorado, and I have a good following here in Boulder. And that's who I think really is watching it. But then I'll get comments from Hungary and South Africa. And it's like, wow, this is really cool. So that's the best part of it. Ryan, do you do you ever um, get into the SEO of, you know, the videos and optimizing them? So from a search engine visibility perspective, you're you know that you, you know, I know it used to be, and gosh, it's it's been a while since I've looked into this. There was a time where you could actually enter 5,000 characters or words to describe your video, which ends up becoming maybe like an 850 word essay that you can essentially write into the description of, of your YouTube video. Do you ever play around with that stuff or are you just kind of producing, putting it out there and calling it a day? This year I am focusing a lot more on that because I am finally realizing the power of YouTube, like I said, and I want to build up my channel. That's, that's a goal now. So yeah, now I'm getting much more focused on the tag words that I put in there. Um, the YouTube description. Now YouTube is prioritizing videos, but not by view count, but by how long people are watching the videos. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm making um, just more engaging content, I guess I would say. I'm making content on a more regular basis. I signed actually with an agency in LA that's helping me 
build my channel. And essentially they said the best way to bring more subscribers is to make regular content. Yeah. So uh, those are all kind of things that I'm playing with. And even to like the thumbnail picture you choose and how visual it is and uh, you know, sharing it through all the, the platforms and then getting it on some bigger blogs, like maybe Elephant Journal or something. And yeah, there's so many tricks to, to the SEO and, and making it skyrocket. And you know, I'm definitely not a master. My videos compared to most YouTube videos don't get seen that much. Well, th that brings us to a great question from Tom Hines asks if you guys have three tips for creating great videos. And I think that could come from any one of the three of you, actually. What are the three tips for creating a great video? Does everybody want to do one? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> My, okay, I'll start. My number one tip to creating good YouTube videos is creating a story that you personally care about. I think I, I talked to a lot of schools and journalism classes and people watch stuff on TV or online and they do a lot of copycat. They're like, oh, that guy's popular. I'm just gonna do what that guy does and that's probably gonna be successful. Uh, but that's not the case. I always say do what you truly believe in and love because your viewers are gonna be able to, to see that. So I'll, I'll jump in um, and I'll just kind of segue off of that. I think uh, maybe just planning your story a bit is uh, is something that I believe is is going to be pretty critical to creating videos that that really engage with people. So you know we're big fans in the agency here. We're big fans of a book called Winning the Story Wars, uh, and this has become this book is is becoming more and more popular. I know with with the movement and storytelling and the reemergence of it really. Uh, but I know that you know there's basic frameworks that you can that you can get into and follow, and so. The framework that we always refer to is just it's an acronym star uh and it's you know situation trouble action and results and uh i know you know ryan you actually touched a little bit on that earlier of you know having having a story you didn't say it in those words but certainly you know those are those are kind of key ingredients um, and if you're making uh, a video that's really going to appeal to people really engage with the idea that story is is the power uh that that's that's a good common format to follow if you can I like it. Yeah, if I had, uh, uh, I guess, one thing to put out there, especially as a neophyte just getting started in this, is um, diving deep into my B-roll and looking for um, some really compelling images so that it's a little less of me as a talking head out there um, yeah. and, uh, and really bringing it to life. And I've been fortunate enough to get a, a few good size donations um, from uh, charitable donations to be able to buy uh, probably more equipment than I know what to do with. So that's a good place to be in and uh, really trying to dive deep into that B-roll and bring in some compelling images. Yeah. So, so John, since, since you are just getting started mm -hmm. uh, calling yourself a neophyte, uh, always appreciate the humility there. <laughs> I'm just going to say, uh, you know, something that comes to mind. Um, are you familiar with the Content Marketing Institute? Uh, I am. Yes, actually. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I, I just had the opportunity to meet the founder, Joe Polizzi, pretty recently. Uh -huh. um, and he was uh, he was talking a lot about, um, you know, creating uh, a I following. One word to describe Montana. Oh, sorry. Oh, that was sorry. me. Oh, that's funny. Was you. That was my show reel. <laughs> Somebody's asking for your website and I'm uh, trying to share it with them. Oh, yeah. Cool. Type it up. Um, so anyway, Joe was saying, look, as you're as you're out there building an audience, um, one of the ingredients is and, and he said, look, this is not, you know, my knowledge. This is like how media companies do it. What they do is they focus on a very specific subject matter. Mm -hmm. um, typically, they're focused on a very specific audience um, and minimally one platform. And so in this case, let's just say it's YouTube. Uh, and what he said, the real key takeaway for me was he said, the consistency is key. So if you're if you're putting something up once a day, be consistent with it. If it's every other day, whatever the case may be, be consistent with it. But here's the killer. Uh, 15 to 19 months is when you should be able to expect some level of success. Uh, and I think that is a great piece of information uh, in terms of expectations, because even as an agency, when we're doing work for brands, you know, there's expectations. Hey, if we just plug away, you know, are we going to see our quick wins in 90 days? Uh, and oftentimes the answer is 
No, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're not. You got to really stick with it and and be frequent, um, consistent and to have that expectation that what you're doing is a long term effort that you're building on a foundation in one channel, uh, really focused in that one channel. And then uh, you diversify uh, wow. and, and get into other channels. So anyway, is that hard it's to worth. communicate with people, though, because I feel like with social you that it. I think the reason we're all on social is because there's the immediate gratification of it, right? You get followers, you have a lot of people, you feel like everything's working. Um, 15 months, it can feel like a lifetime to some people. Is that something hard to communicate as an agency? Well, I think it's really hard to communicate. And as an agency, you know, a lot of what we're putting together are strategies for multi-channel campaigns. Okay. Right? And so the first thing we look at is, hey, do you even have an audience on a particular channel? Uh, and then if so, how do you put together a campaign or a message or a story or whatever that can play across all of those channels? Uh, but, you know, Content Marketing Institute would say, hey, at the end of the day, uh, what you should be doing is focusing mostly on one channel, mm -hmm. drive it for that 15 to 19 months. Nobody likes that timeline, by the way, but it is what it is, right? If it were easy, we'd all do it, right? right. Uh, and um, And then, of course, you know, they go on further to say, that the real value in growing that audience uh, becomes in collecting email addresses. And so they would say harvesting that audience means collecting email addresses, which is a whole other conversation, right? Yeah, I, I, I have read Joe's book. Uh, I think it's Content Inc. And yeah, yeah just a fabulous uh, eye-opening uh, book uh, and uh, doing my best to, to stay patient and, and also stay persistent in terms of getting content out there. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and me personally, as my own brand, I've been putting YouTube videos up since 2006, but I've never been aggressive about going for subscribers or anything. I still only have 2,000 subscribers. That's nothing. And so that's why this year I'm really trying to go for it. But I do know that it's very slow. I think I've gained 100 subscribers since January, which is not that much, but it's like I'm creating more content and I'm hoping, you know, 15 to 19 months that I'll get something going. <laughs> it's a slow road, but I think it's worth it. Yeah, very cool. I do know there is a uh, there is a YouTube playbook uh, that Google has published out there. Um, so you guys should look into that if you haven't already. Uh, and those are just, you know, list of best practices. Um, you know, that gets into a little bit of the SEO uh, type of stuff. And um, maybe I can just Google it real quick and, and find a URL, but I know, um, we've actually built services within the agency around that playbook. Cool. And it's funny, anybody can get it, but you know, lots of people don't. And when they do, they look at it and don't do anything with it. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. <clears throat> cool. Well, um, gosh, we've totally blabbed today. We blabbed our heads off. <laughs> this is a real one. <laughs> this is a real one. Well, I, I ended up hitting the record button again because you know, you guys were saying some, some cool things and, uh, Hopefully it's going to be beneficial to the audience as well. So yeah. um, I'm going to go eat some lunch. If that's Good. cool with you guys. Cool. Hey, I'm, guys. I'm waiting for a phone call right now from Travel Channel. So I'm, like, <laughs> I'm talking about YouTube and YouTube, but I'm like, oh, TV, the Travel <laughs> Channel. It's like, You're like, oh, pay my mortgage. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Someday YouTube will pay. <laughs> right now I still have to go for the jobs that actually give you money. I want to give props to jobs. what I want. And I want to give props to John for being our very first intrepid caller. You're awesome. Oh. Thanks for calling in. Totally appreciate hey. it. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the newbie uh, dial in. That's awesome. Oh, I like your shirt, by the way. Oh, yeah. Coexist. Yeah. <laughs> very cool. That's very Austin esque. Okay. And, and Boulder, too. Yes. And Boulder, too. That's yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, hey, thanks again for joining, and uh, we'll catch you guys later. All right. Have a good one. Thanks, guys.